We're speaking with Martin Kramer, who has been living in Israel for how long? Uh, 37 years. So you have a pretty good view of Israeli politics and uh, military. Prime Minister Netanyahu recently made a trip to the Gulf. An announcement was made by Oman. What did they say? Uh, the Omanis, uh, first of all, publicized the visit. It was not a secret visit. It was a very public visit. The Sultan of Oman was photographed with Netanyahu. And then later, the uh, Omanis went to a, um, a, a conference in Bahrain of uh, Arab leaders where they, um, uh, they said quite explicitly that Israel is part of the region. We have to accept that it's part of a region. And we should expect it to have the, the same rights and responsibilities of other states in the Middle East. So in a way, it was a vindication of Netanyahu's policy because he's all along said that um, what drives the Arab world is concern about Iran, not concern for the Palestinians. And when that concern about Iran reaches a certain point, they'll be willing to deal with us, even if there is no final deal of the century on the Palestinian issue. And he's right. But uh, if somehow in the future, after the U.S. gives the Saudis the billion dollars in weaponry they're looking for, and Oman, I imagine they're looking for American weaponry, uh, if there's a re regime change in Iran and that uh, bogeyman goes away, what happens to all those weapons uh, 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 that could be used towards the Zionist state? Well, it's almost an impossible scenario. Iran is a huge country. It's not going away. Um, whether it's ruled by this regime or another regime, um, Iran is going to be a presence in the Middle East. And by the way, the Arabs were not happy with the Iran of the Shah either. They also felt threatened by um, um, Iran before the revolution. Okay. So one way or another, fear of Iran is an organizing principle of Arab politics. It's been accentuated, of course, because of this present regime. So um, there's no point really in thinking too much about um, um, scenarios that have almost zero probability of, of taking place. Now, another interesting scenario would be, in fact, some kind of regime change in Saudi Arabia quite separate from events in Iran. Uh, what if the royal house were to run into trouble? What if there were to be some kind of um, a populist upsurge which would turn out the house of Saud? Uh, I don't think that that's likely in the near term, but if it did happen, you'd face a problem of, um, of um, all the, the weaponry that Saudi Arabia has acquired. The only thing you can say there is that the Saudis are not like the Iranians. Um, the Iranians are technologically sophisticated. They can run a lot of weather's weapon systems all by themselves. The Saudis are not technologically sophisticated. They've always needed Americans or Pakistanis or others to help them run their weapon systems. And we see their ineptitude uh, in, the, in the use of some of these systems in the war in Yemen. Um, this has not been a, a, a great achievement from a military point of view from the Saudi perspective. Um, so American weapons make Saudi Arabia dependent on um, the United States. They deepen that dependence. They're dependent anyway because they have to sell their oil to the West. Um, so I, I would say that in the meantime, it's a the, the sale of weapons in large quantities to Saudi Arabia creates Saudi dependence on the United States, keeps the American arms industry busy, provides a lot of jobs in America, um, and, um, and doesn't pose a, an immediate or midterm threat to Israel. Um, if one wants to get out to far out scenarios, that's another story. Americans have often expressed concern. Uh, opponents of Israel have claimed, well, uh, we don't like all that foreign aid going to Israel, and uh, supporters have claimed that, well, 75% uh, of that money gets spent in the United States on U.S. weaponry and supporting U.S. jobs. Obama came in and changed that. What, uh, to, to say, uh, uh, w what's the state, the status of, of that under the new uh, American Trump administration? Well, the Obama administration did conclude an arms package with Israel. They said that they were making a distinction between politics and military support. There's no foreign aid, by the way. It's almost all military aid. Um, and, um, you know, from um, the American point of view, it makes 
um, perfect sense to sell, in fact, as many arms to Israel as they can. First of all, for the reason you indicated, it's a, it's a jobs program in America. But second, it basically, it, it, it makes Israel much more attentive to American policy needs in the Middle East. Um, because when every screw, nut, and bolt is made in the USA in Israel's systems, and Israel makes some things that's on its own, it's true it has its own military industries, but you know, the heavy duty stuff comes from the United States. Then when the United States speaks, Israel listens. Um, and so this is not a gift to Israel, it's an enhancer of US policy. It's not a giveaway um, to um, the Jewish state, it, is, it creates leverage for the United States on Israel. And by the way, there have been occasions when the United States has not been afraid to use it. Uh, use the leverage. Use the leverage that it has. So, um, and so it's a mistake to look at it as, um, as, a, as aid and wiser to look at it as one more tool that the United States has to keep its allies in close orbit. How real is the threat that Iran poses to, to uh, Israel? Or are they just gunning for uh, some kind of uh, protectorate, uh, protection, acceptance of the Americans, in the same way that North Korea is wrangling for acceptance for the regime and a ton of money? I think Iran wants to be the dominant power in the Middle East. Um, they think that um, through, their con through their connections, their close connections with proxies and clients, from Yemen to Iraq to Lebanon, uh, they can emerge ultimately as, um, as uh, the preeminent force in the Middle East. And look at what we have today. Iran can give an order, as it did over this past weekend, for rockets to fall in Israel. And they fall in Israel. In this case, from Gaza, from their client, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They can give an order tomorrow and rockets will fall in the north of Israel. In fact, rockets can fall all over Israel. This is not a capacity that Iran had 20 years ago. It's a capacity that they built. And they can say, what we can do to Israel, Israel can't do to us in the same measure. Uh, we're not going to have rockets falling on Tehran tomorrow, coming from Israel, unless there's a general regional war, whereas we can do it through proxies. I think in this respect, Israel has been, um, has, has been in a disadvantage. The Iranians have proxies. They have people who will do things on their behalf. Israel doesn't have proxies. Israel does, has to do everything itself. Um, and um, so um, that's why it's important for Israel to build up some of its relations in the Middle East. Um, just recently, Israel is showed off a visit from um, a high-level official from Azerbaijan, which borders Iran. And of course, Oman is just across the Gulf from Iran. These are never going to be proxies of Israel, but at least they could be in potential allies to Israel, or even si silent partners of Israel, because it's the only way to beat the Iranians at their own game. Um, they have a long list of people who would do their bidding. Israel needs to build up a list of people who, while they may not do Israel's bidding, will, um, will coordinate with Israel to take uh, action um, to, uh, to give the Iranians a sense that um, they too are, um, can be surrounded by um, by constraining forces. If people want to follow more of your writings, where would they look? At my website, www.martinkramer.org. That's the best place. Yeah, welcome.